I thought if I, if I come on with a hot drink, I'll be more sort of sensible and normal. <laughs> what have you got there? It's just a coffee, but it stopped me walking on like a bell end. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a different night, isn't it? So I thought if I have a drink and a, wear a sweater and stuff, I'll, oh, I'm already breaking those rules. Carry on. <laughs> um, well, look, I th normally we start with what is high performance, but I'd just like to start by exploring how you feel sitting there doing this, because you've obviously played here a few times, but you've not done this. So in the spirit of exploration, which we talk about a lot on this podcast, what yep. does this feel like for you? Strangest thing about this is being sat down, which I very, very rarely uh, do. Even at home, I'm always w working, always moving. In fact, I do a lot of telly, and uh, that's the number one plate complaint I get. Why can't you just fucking sit still? But there is a gene, apparently. You've either got that twitchy leg gene or you, or you haven't, and I have. So that's the weirdest thing about this is being sat down because I use my body to express myself so much, and it's like, no. Stay still. Good. That's why we gave you a chair. We were I know. Like, and I've also managed to do my whole career without wearing one of these. Like, <laughs> poor Brittany. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what is high performance to you? Well, I'm an avid uh, fangirl of the pod. And uh, I think that tonight, performance obviously has two, it has two meanings. Obviously, we know how you guys are normally using it. I think you mean is the execution of a task or skill to a high degree. But of course, with me as well, it also means to literally perform, to put on a, put on a display. So it's double faceted. But still, the formula remains the same. It's going to be disappointing. It's going to be brutal. And I would say it's H plus J, no, I, I'm going to say hard work plus sacrifice, and this, this is crucial, multiplied by joy. If you leave off that last bit, yeah. you are toast. If you leave off one of the other two, you are toast. I had so much fun, but I can't be asked to stick at it. If you're going to work your tits off, but never miss a story time with baby, you are fucked. It's <laughs> hard work plus sacrifice times joy. If you've missed story time, like I have tonight, for example, are you still buzzing at the end of your night because you think you've done something great? You're probably engaged in high performance at that point. Interesting. I think we should explore those three, shouldn't we? Yeah, definitely. Let's start with hard work then. Yeah. Because people see this, they see the TV shows. Yeah. Where does the hard work come in for you? <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I'll take you back to your original premise. I know, you're, I know you, you're sort of saddled with this word, high performance, which doesn't mean getting off your tits before going off stage, by the way. Um, high can only ever mean as an adjective above whatever the central or median level is. That's what that word means. So we can make this discussion as cosy as we like, and it's, with, it's always within your world, and everything's great, and it's whatever that means to you. Agree, back everything you said but you've also got to be higher than whatever the median level is happening around you. So for example, in my case, that was I was working full time, I loved my job, fatal if you want to get into entertainment or stand up, if you're in a job where you're already engaged in high performance and love what you're doing. Yeah. And what was the job you were doing? I was, I was a copywriter, so thinking up lines, puns, headlines, TV, adverts, things like that, I loved it. To get out of work at 6 p.m. already milked, like a, a saggy creative teat just blowing out dust. And then <laughs> drive, as I did one night from, I don't know if anyone knows London, but to get from southwest London to north London is hell. To drive to the frog and bucket around the corner here to do unpaid work for 10 minutes just to see if I've got it that night and drive back again and be in work. And to do that for three years without physically dying or having a breakdown, I would call that graft. Yeah, I would. <laughs> well, let's go back to the start of that then, though. Yep. So, like, what, so how did you know that that was something you did want to invest that kind of sacrifice uh, to pursue? Do you know what? It's, uh, it's interesting. Listening to a lot of, um, if you listen to a lot of stand-ups, that's what I do, by the way, stand-up comedian, just in case some people think I'm Nick Grimshaw, <laughs> I can tell. And, uh, <laughs> <it's> just... <laughs> so why is Grimmy putting on an Essex voice? No, um... <laughs> That's what high performance is, guys, being two people at once. <laughs> no, uh, there's two ways in, isn't it? Every single... I, I'm a bit of a, uh, uh, an optimist with things like this. I honestly believe every single person in this room and every person who downloads this episode has a God-given amazing skill and talent. The tragedy is some of us get all the way to the nursing home for we're like, oh, fuck, I was supposed to do downhill skiing, or whatever it is. Okay? 
And sorry to get political at the top, but this is where high performance meets reality of the council estate, I'm afraid. If you start life poor or single mum or from some sort of background where you don't have lots of access to opportunities and lots of exciting middle class things happening to you at the weekend and being exposed to lots of stuff, it is fucking luck whether you encounter the thing you were born to do. Which we don't talk about enough. That is the bad news. Yeah. If, I, if I'd gone my whole life, always the funny one, or my personality now, this is my real personality, I'm not put this on because I'm sat on stage at the Lowry, I'm high energy, uh, attention seeking, bell end friend, first one dancing at the wedding, always saying something outrageous or hilarious, that's just who I was in my group. Very common with people born June, July and August to have bigger personalities because that's how you survived at school, right? You're the smallest, you're the most behind, you're 11 months younger than everyone else. So that's got my whole life. Uh, Get to you, get, go to the one university in the land, how I got there's a whole other fucking high performance story, but <laughs> that didn't have a stand-up club. I, I got all the way to my middle class thinking up headlines job without any contact with stand-up comedy whatsoever. Stand-up, I thought, was, you know, Jim Davison, Jimmy Jones, Bernard Manning, uh, all that old school shit that my mum and dad and my grandparents watched. I didn't realise there was the... I thought Edinburgh was ballet and posh shit that wasn't for me. I was so immersed in my world of writing and thinking up headlines to make, be the first person in my family to make real money, that it never occurred to me that I could stick a microphone under the funny shit I'm saying and pay my mortgage that way. It was someone at work, the creative planner, who just said, why don't you do stand-up? Why don't you try it? And it was no different from trying rock climbing for a laugh or something. I literally just did, you know, like any one of you might, I don't know, do learn French for a week or do a bungee jump. It was that. I'm going to do it once, just something to tell the grandkids. But then what often inhibits a lot of people is that voice in the head or the voice that they might imagine their parents in their head saying, so you can't do that. People from our background don't do that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, well, I didn't, I, didn't appreciate, I didn't approach it like it was something I was going to do. It was a dare. Like, go on, jump off that. Say, so, go on, jump off that cliff. And you jump off, and you're like, fuck, I'm supposed to do cliff diving. That's what I'm supposed to do. It was honestly, it was, it's that boring and by chance that I ended up doing it. I picked up that microphone at that first gig, which was as average as fuck. And I'd be, I was taking a modium. It did nothing. That's how nervous I was. Uh, honestly, <laughs> I used to think the phrase shitting yourself was figurative. Try stand up. <laughs> and uh, it will loosen up even a stubborn pensioner. And uh, it's fight or flight. We were talking at the side of the stage. It's weird. Tonight, you've seen what I consider one of my biggest phobias, being up high, sitting on a rock ledge. They're the two biggest human phobias, fear of physical annihilation and fear of social rejection. Back in the day, those two, you'd be dead on the savanna with the zebra bones in a matter of weeks. So I was so nervous, I didn't have time to analyze it. It was just a bungee jump. And I got up there doing this average gig, and I got the first l laugh. And it was when I was a kid, there was this advert to stop people doing heroin. Um, if you're my age, you'll remember it. Go, when you first do it, you'll like it. You'll be sick, but you'll come back for more. Um, that's what it was like. It went in. I was sick that night, diarrhea, vomiting. Everything about it was negative. But the buzz, I was like, what the fuck was that? And then I went back and back, and then I lost my girlfriend, then my job started to fall. It was like a junkie falling into a drug. And I was like, oh my God. I've waited all this time, and I find it, it so easy. You, so what, what, the, like, like what was the hit that you got from it? Uh, it's the hit, the, if anyone who's ever been intoxicated or a bit dance, your first dance at your wedding, that, that rush of complete emotion, of just being where you want to, where you want to be doing the thing you're supposed to do, being with the person you're supposed to be, telling someone that you love them and kissing them and thinking, just that completeness. But for, from a human being to, to go onto a stage and have a random, well, it was about 200 people that night, but increasingly two, three, 4,000 people laugh. I can't tell you, it's like someone injecting amphetamine into your ego. <laughs> You're high as fuck. Any, everyone in this room, and everyone listening to this, has done a meeting at work where they've stood up, aced it, and everyone thought you were a legend after lunch. It's just that, but amplified. <laughs> but that, that thrill and that buzz, right? It doesn't get you to here this evening. It doesn't get you selling three, four, five thousand tickets for no. one night stand up, right? So when did the determination and the hard work and the sacrifice and the single-minded determination come from? Because 
you know, people will look at you now in this world we live in with 15 second Instagram video, yeah. and instant gratification, then Amazon delivering stuff tomorrow and go, no, I just might be a stand up and see how it goes. And I get those messages all the time. Do you? All the and time. And what do you feel? I take you back to the original formula, which I, I did uh, trot it out a bit glibly. But if you're not willing to do graph time sacrifice, uh, plus sacrifice times joy, this is the problem. People want to leave out the sacrifice. It's not nice. I don't. I didn't want to miss um, a part of my twenties and my and my thirties when all my friends were going raving. I was fucking Ibiza clubber. I'm like last man standing as the sun comes up outside Pasha DC10 as the plane goes over. I was still partying hard. I had to drop it all, like a, to live like a fucking monk because this is my this is my muscle. If once and that's because I was timesing by joy. If the joy of climbing up that mountain face is high enough, right? You won't, the, the graft and the sacrifice comes with it. You, if you leave out that third crucial part, the joy drives you like an animal to put more graft and more sacrifice in. So what do you say to people then that send you a message and say, oh, I'd love to be a stand-up comic. Can I shadow you, support you, come on talk? You I, know, I, always I always encourage, but what they mostly want is a, is a veiled thing. Oh man, I'd love to do it. Have a look at my YouTube link of my hilarious sketches I'm doing at home. Sometimes they might be funny. What they really want me to do is to give them like artificial, yeah, come out to the Lowry, where I am in September. Come out to the Lowry <laughs> and, and do 20 minutes first so that 1,600 of you immediately, you know, 10% of you go and see there too. It doesn't work like that. They want to cut out the, the three to five years, unpaid, three to four times a week, 20 minute sets in comedy clubs. That is roughly what you need. Three times a week, unpaid in all areas of the country with Edinburgh shows for three to five years. You can't cut out the H, the G, the graft part. So what I say to them is, I applaud your passion. I've seen your stuff, it's funny. But you wouldn't go up to a guy in the gym, like you know, some guy with, like, with a neck so big he looks like he'll shit himself if you call his name, one of those <laughs> with massive guns, and say to him, Oh man, can I get your muscles? What do I need to do? Because he would go, Well, just get on the machines and go. Just put the five years in, eat fucking shitloads of chicken, uh, and, <laughs> and get on the machine. There's no substitute for getting on the machine. I wish there was. I wish I could sit here and go, the secret to high performance is you download this app and, and then you just turn around in a circle and, and then the next day you sell out of it. It's, it's long, yeah. boring graft. It's the same as raising a child. Anyone got children? <laughs> There's all the, would you like it if someone came up to you and your eight year old's so magical. How can I get mine like that overnight? You'd probably scream in their face. That's eight years of sacrifice graft mixed yeah. with joy. It's not, there's no magic formula or secret answer here. It's get on the machines and start bicep curl, or if you're a, a girl, glutes. <laughs> <laughs> so can we talk about the graft then? Because yeah. I'm interested in your craft that I've heard you speak about some comedians are writers that they'll yeah. craft it and acts and some of them just get up there and just improvise and learn yeah. from it. Would you tell us which one you are? Right, so broadly speaking, there are two, two types of comedians. This is very simplified. So when you go to the theatre to watch a comic, one of two types is coming out to entertain you, whether it's Sarah Millican, whoever, Judy Love, me, Jimmy Carr, who I'm replaced at the last minute tonight. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you go out, <laughs> when you go out, you're either seeing someone who is a razor sharp writer, has honed and balanced every noun and adjective and adverb, and if you go and see it twice, it'll be responded to differently every night because stand up is a conversation and your laughter is the response. But broadly speaking, if you go and see Tim Vine, you'll see this, who I love by the way, you'll see the same amazing one lines over and over again. If you see me, it's the same tour, but I've never written my stand-up down, ever. There's no specific wording for any routine. Say I'm going to do the routine about something funny happened at the Lowry. That's all I've got written as a bullet point. Do the funny story about spilling your coffee on Jake Humphrey at the Lowry. That's all I would go on with. And every night I'll add bits, take bits off, I'm bored, I'll bail halfway through. So I would call myself type B. Type A you don't know what personality you're going to get at the side of the stage. You might meet um, one of these brilliant writers and they've got a completely different personality if you bump into them in, in Asda or whatever. Whereas I've just monetized my pre-existing personality. That's how I describe myself. So, yes, there's, there's, there's funny stories I know I'm going to tell, but ultimately, you've seen me backstage, there's not a massive gap between what I'm like now and what we were like 10 minutes ago. But I think what 
then makes you unique as, as, as a high performer then Russell is your ability to take feedback, to be able to, yeah. uh, to adapt in the moment. So we were talking backstage around the most effective speed in deterrent is radar displays that when you drive through it, you get a feedback loop. They tell you what your speed is mm -hmm. and you can adapt your behavior in the moment. And that is more effective. Would you tell us about how you take feedback on board uh, in relation to your craft? Do you mean sort of long-term feedback like from journalists or do you mean feedback if I was stood on this stage right now calibrating feedback as it comes at me? Well, both. The short-term feedback on a stage but equally the long-term feedback for your career. Well, that's one of the advantages of being a type B comic. The disadvantage is it's highly unlikely I will ever drop a routine that everyone quotes forever and it's like a garlic bread or an out-out because I'm not sat at home going, what's the perfect wording? Um, the advantage is if I go out and I'm going to open with, I don't know, remarking about something quite divisive like Brexit or vaccine and it slips out my mouth at the top and I feel a resistance from the audience, I can just go, fuck that, right? All right? Who's here with their wife tonight? And, and, and just immediately change gear and adapt. And I'll, that comes from the energy, from whether the, la the laugh is swallowed, from, from whether it's, it's hesitant, from whether there's an ooh, you're constantly reading the noises. You can feel it. You don't have to be a stand-up. If you never walked into a room and felt people don't like you and you don't know how you, you know that, you can literally feel they don't like you. Well, it's like that, but trained. You can feel what they like and what they don't like. But how do you detach yourself, like your own ego from that and not think, well, I think it's funny. And if they don't, it's their problem, not mine. They're, they're two different issues. The second is a problem of, of writing. So if I thought my, this, my story I just made up about spilling coffee on Jake is hilarious, and I find it funny, and I tried it a couple of times in its loop. Well, I just bin it off. I'm not attached to that. It's just funny to me and Jake. It's not funny to everyone else. Fuck it. In the bin. Next. This, the former challenge is much tougher and takes years of practice. Years and years and years. I was sat next to none other than Andrew Motion once, who is a poet, uh, not a duodenum doctor. And um, he... We were arguing about whether stand-up is the only art form where the person is the actual carrier of, of the art, if you can call it art, itself. Do you know what I mean? There's no, if I write a book and you all think it's shit, it will hurt, but at the end of the day, the book was shit. Yep. Um, and Andrew Motion was arguing poetry like that. I was like, well, not really. The poem's shit. When, I, when you go on and you're booed or hated, it's really hard to remember. It's still the act and the material that they're rejecting because it's so the well. If you're doing your job properly, the weld is invisible. The, the weld, W, I know my accent's strong, W E L, weld is invisible. And that takes training. And in the early days, there's lots of lying in bed feeling like it's like a. Um, like, it's like a physical feeling, like a milder version of being dumped. You know that feeling dumped where you wake up and there's that sick feeling in your belly and you're like, oh, I'm just going to cry again and eat some chocolate. It's like a milder version of that, a bad gig. So where does your resilience to deal with what can be at times negative feedback come from? It's, again, it comes from going back, I'm afraid. Uh, going back, you know, if you're a, a boxer, I'm pretty sure the hundredth time you're punched in the face, it still hurts, but yeah. you're ready for a punch in the face. And so how do you parent? I know you've only got a very young child, but have you thought about how you parent? Because one of our issues is this helicopter parenting, hovering around your kids, yep. removing all obstacles, speaking to the teacher if there's a problem, speaking to their friends' parents if there's an issue. And then your child gets to the age of 21, they leave home, go for the first job interview. First time ever they fail, they don't have the vitamins and minerals to deal with that failure. Yep. No, have you thought about injecting that resilience into your your child and how we can do it for our, our children? Well, there's, there's quite a, I, I don't know who, who are parents in the audience, quite a lot. There's quite a break at the moment. Anyone got under, under eight, small kids? There's two tribes at the moment, isn't there? We don't use negative language, we don't use no's, we don't believe in them having a negative experience. Oh look, Josh, you stabbed the cat, but he's expressing himself. <laughs> uh, uh, there's no, oh, it's spilt milk. Look, you spilt milk on the new carpet, but that's a chance for an art exploration let's turn it let's turn this vomit smelling ruined carpet into art um, now there's lots of studies that will say it's better to fill your child with positivity because the big bad world is coming for them I'm, I know I'm, I'm messing around here but I'm genuinely not having a go at anyone your kid your kids your choice I like the word no 
I think sooner or later you're going to encounter it. And if you go to reception at five and you're like, I'm going to rub my poo on the wall. And they go, no, your world is going to go pretty quick. Yeah. Um, so a little, like a vaccine, a little dose of negativity made by AstraZeneca at home into the brain, <laughs> followed by a second dose during the teens. <laughs> probably prepares you to fall a little bit. It's, it's also difficult if, you, if you've clawed your way out of a council estate like me. I don't want to get the violin out, but I've lived every tier you can live at, apart from the very top and the very bottom. I've never been homeless, and I have never been in the aristocracy and lived in a castle, but I've done mother and baby shelter, and now I live in a really nice house. So I've lived every level you can, through council flat, council house. I've experienced each one, and it is harder not to want to lavish that luxury and protection on your child. So we try to build in as, as many controlled negative experiences as we can. So I do a lot of, even if we can afford something, we can't afford it, I've run out of money, I need to go and do a gig now. I do a lot of that, a lot of it. Because yeah. that's what I grew up with. Which brings us to a conversation about your dad, because I don't think any conversation about your background, yeah. we can escape him. So you described him in, in that brilliant book you wrote as the silverback, yeah. the guy that was... Uh, like a very domineering character yep. in your life. But you also said that he was constantly deferring happiness. He was always waiting for something better to come along. So you spoke before about we're often the products of our environment. Mm. What did you take from your dad, good and bad, that you used with your daughter? Now my, my theory with parents is, I think it's dads and mums, I can only speak from dads, is we, you don't meet many people who are sort of a bit like their dad or mum, but slightly moved on. You either become a carbon copy or a visceral opposite reaction. I know some of you in the middle are like, well, I'm, I'm a bit, but many of us in the room now are like, I've, I've made it my, <laughs> my life. My house is chaotic, sleepovers, family always welcome to stay, opposite of my childhood, which was the spare room was locked off, everything had to be planned, you know, nothing was done too impulsive, so I brought that in. So my dad was hyper-masculine, shaving-headed, Dave, doorman, steroid-using, weight-lifting, metal-welding, meat-eating, 16-stone, 5% body fat nut job. And uh, <laughs> I'm me. And, uh, <laughs> unbelievably heterosexual. And, um, uh, it just made me want... It started off just to annoy him, really. I knew it annoyed him if I skipped and didn't want to be down the, the gym and... I got to 11, I was 8, my brother was 11, and weight, weights appeared. They just appeared, and we were in a council house, we bought our own, and we built a shed at the bottom, and he's like, you need to get down there, three sets of fucking ten, you need to get big, or people will walk all over you, boy. You need to get yourself fucking massive for anyone mouse, you fucking knock them out. And it just, it just made me so scared of being in those situations that I learned the one muscle that is worth training uh, the, this one, <laughs> and this one, the gob. And I got, m mostly through school, really, I should have been bullied daily. Gobby, small, virgin, scared of drugs. <laughs> but I got to 16 with pretty easy ride, and I was not in with anyone cool. So interesting. I, I had to survive. So yeah, I think it made, it made the, the answer is it made me the opposite. The positives, yeah. the graft, the sacrifice, he left out the joy. And that's the massive mistake my dad made. I call it, you know, it is mostly dads like this. You know, I've worked all day for you. And then I've come and collected you from school. Put the nail through the other hand while I do my speech. <laughs> I have worked my whole, you know, the Christ-like sacrifice. Night after night, my life, shit for you. And I thought, now I'm older, I feel so sorry for him that he went through his life like that. And it wasn't just, you're almost right with deferred joy. It was my dad expected it to be shit all the time. If we're going on holiday, traffic will be shit. <laughs> I'll bet you the airport, oh, there will be a delay. I'll bet you the food will be crap. Constantly, that's poison. You, that is interesting because people who expect it, find it. Yeah, they do. And did you find that with your dad? And I wonder whether you live in a different way, whether you live understanding what? that actually the optimist in the room is the person who everything falls in their lap because they're the optimist, it's, because they see the opportunity. No, I don't. Optimism, I have a problem with. <laughs> I've never met a rich optimist. And uh, <laughs> it's called realism, yeah? Prepare your 
self for bad things, the worst, check your, check your window locks, check your bank account, check yourself, sit up straight, make your bed and all that shit. But be so happy when the, the positives come. My mum, yep. she probably listened to this, she always used to say to me, I didn't understand your, your dad. He, he had, at the time, two healthy sons, my brother's unwell now, two healthy sons. Yes, it was a former council house, but we bought our own council house, end of terrace, doubled it, four bedroom place, swimming pool in the garden that my dad dug, gym at the bottom of the garden. Yes, we lived in a council street. Yes, it's Essex, so there's people with like the lions and the Lambos and all that. But at the end of the day, what did he have to be unhappy about? He earned good money, skilled manual labor. And when my dad pegged it early, not a coincidence, when his heart gave out young, I, we had to go through his stuff, it was really sad. And he, there was a diary, that year's diary was in, it was in his workshop. And I thought, what the fuck am I gonna find in it? It was the most bleak thing I've ever encountered. I wish I'd never read it. It was one to two words every day. Rained, work was shit, James was shit, really? argued, bad traffic. Wow. It was like the haikus of an Essex man on a downer. Yeah, yeah. I wonder whether that made you cry though, because actually, it did, like, yeah, that it is broke the me life up. of a man that. It broke me up because yeah. we weren't, we weren't stuck in that council flat where we started. When when I was born, my dad had to visit me for eight months because my mum was the only housing we had was the mother and baby shelter. So my mum was in a shared room and I was like in a Moses basket next to her bed. That went on for eight months. My dad would go to work, have a bit of dinner next to my mum's area in the room, and then go home. The progress from that to the house I've just described now, look, I wish I'd have been older so I could have said to him, he shook him and gone, are you mental? You've won the lottery. So when did you realize that the one thing that was missing for him was the joy? When did that penny drop for you that joy had to be part of that equation? That is a bloody good question. I think it's gradual. I don't yeah. think I ever woke up one day. I think as I've got... Did you see it when you were a kid though? No. You wouldn't have done, would you? It's funny to us. All you knew. Me and my brother used to act out all of the, as soon as my dad left the room, not in front of him, obviously I wanted to live. But as soon as, <laughs> like, for, I'll never forget, it was the 10th, ber it's 10th birthday party. I mean, I, I know I should sound like I'm not over it, but it's 10th birthday party, having a pizza. It was a glass of water that was spilt. That was it. Not the dad that whacks you, clips you around the ear. I was never hit. It was, oh, that's it. The meal's ruined. Water everywhere, the chair's soaked. My trousers are soaked. The, to him, the whole meal was spoiled yeah. because of a glass of water. And then me and James, we couldn't, my brother, we got home and then we'd reenact it and I'd play my mum, Dave, calm down. <laughs> no, to us, it was, it was hilarious at the time. Yeah. Now it breaks my freaking heart yeah. because if I'm out with Minna, that's my daughter, and I spill a glass of water, I'm like, it doesn't, not, it doesn't matter. If she's not done it out of naughtiness, if it's done out of accident, what's the big deal? So I, like, I found it fascinating reading your background, Russell, that you started stand-up when your dad had passed away. Yeah. Why do you think that was then? Again, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It was an actual coincidence. Right. Um, it was the same month, it was the same week, I believe. Um, my dad was one of those dads where if you said, oh, I uh, cycled 30 miles, you'd go, I used to cycle 40 mile, miles to work when I was a kid. If I lifted, a, oh, I used to lift that. I ate more chicken than everything he'd always done and tried. <laughs> And so the only verdict my dad ever passed on my stand-up, I was out having dinner at my mum and dad's house. By now, obviously, I've moved out. I'm living the high life, advertising and all that. I've gone like for Sunday lunch or something. I said, I've done something crazy. I'm going to do an amateur comedy night. It's in the diary for August. It's in the diary for September. So yeah, my dad passed early September, and this was late September. And my dad didn't look up. He went, I tried it once. Waste of fucking time. Back to his dad. <laughs> Did he? That's it. That was the only comment that was ever passed. He did try. He did try it. I was a red coat for a season. I was covered in birds. I <laughs> fucking loved it. That's, that's what he said. I'm not saying it to be funny. But, <laughs> but, I suppose this is a difficult. So, so but, but, how, but what, Sorry, a, what a weird co what a, what a mm. fucking weird. I'm not spiritual. I wish I was. I'm jealous of those of you that have belief. I genuinely mean that. Uh, but what a strange coincidence because. I obviously was in the process of organizing my dad's funeral. My brother by now had started to, as I describe it, descend into darkness, was getting very ill. He'd been sectioned twice. So I was trying to deal with my brother, who obviously went completely you know, crazy when my, when my dad went, went like that suddenly. So I was dealing with that, dealing with my brother's mental health, 
sitting on the steps of Enfield Council, trying to get my brother housed, trying to deal with my mum. My dad died while they were on holiday. I had to organise, dad, get the body back. And then my first gig came up right in the middle of all that. And I went through with it. Well, that, yeah. that alone tells us something, though, about mindset, doesn't it? It, yeah, it was more... I wish I could, I don't want to, I want to go with you, but it was more to have something unrelated to what was happening. That's how I sold it to myself. I'm going to do something unrelated that night. I know I won't be able to think about anything else all day and it worked. And of course, I then had that almost spiritual experience on stage of, oh my God. And then I just banged a load more in the diary, dealt with the personal situation. And then that was it. Two, three times a week. It was crazy. It just, it, it I think another area that I'd like to explore with you, though, Russell, is that, that, like, I wrote down the quote that from Leonardo da Vinci that an average human looks without seeing, listens without hearing, touches without feeling, and eats without tasting. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, just listening to you tonight, you, the, your observational skills are off the radar. You know, your ability to, to hear what somebody's saying and, and then take it and, uh, yeah. and, and do something with it. I'm interested in that as a high-performance skill your ability to observe at a deeper level than most. Yeah, well, I've, I've listened to enough of these and met enough amazing people. And by that, I count e like every job. You know, when you meet like an amazing midwife or an amazing nurse or an amazing doctor, so, you know, you need a little bit of talent in there. You, you, just, you just do. There's no way of getting around it. Uh, so I probably was always a bit more observant than your average Joe. Is, like um, Robin Ince has actually studied this properly. He's another comedian you should definitely check out. There is definitely something to do with being born in our society in July or August because you have to find other ways to survive or being a younger sibling. It's not a coincidence that most of the elite sports people you speak to, I guarantee, go and check, will be born in September, October, November. That is not a fucking coincidence. So us, who were the tiddlers in reception class, we quickly had to find other ways to survive. And I'm guessing observation mixed with me having a funny sense of humour has led to the natural talent. Past that, there's nothing mysterious or clever about it. It's no different from any of you if you're a wine taster or a mechanic that can just go, that's, that's the alternator. And you're like, how the fuck did you do that? And it's just got experience. I can, come on, I can read a front row. I can read, I'm trying not to now, read the body language, particularly yours. Read the body language. <laughs> but I just, I, just, I just can. And this, uh, Lindsay's like, my wife's from up here, so I live up here now. She's like, I think you're psychic. You must be psychic. How do you work out what people do? And uh, on, you, anyone who's been to see me live will know on more than, more than one occasion in a week, so I'm doing five tour dates, I will get the person's job more or less correct. And often the name as well. Mm -hmm. I can tell by stance whether you're, work, whether you're working class. If you're a sort of middle class man, will sit like that, stroke the chin, cross the legs, taking the information. Yes, this is shit I didn't know I'd learn. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Gary, Gary, who's been grafting all week, he's like that, and he's got a chunky clap, the, out, the arms come out. I can read all of that stuff. I can also read when someone's cl closing on, on mass, like an audience, yeah, I can yeah. read body language and then, and, then, and then laugh. So it's just anything. If you do it over and over again and love doing it, <laughs> with a few exceptions, you're going to get better at it. <laughs> I can think of one thing that doesn't apply to. But <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, exactly. I'm not surprised, you know, that you listen to the High Performance Podcast of all of the many amazing podcasts that are out there. Because if you take a look at what you do and what a lot of our guests do who operate in the elite sporting environment, you can see the parallels between the two. Uh, so this is the other thing, which until I came on here, I've never spoke about before. So as far as I know, this is you're the, I'm the first like pure entertainer that goes on stage and either sings or dances or does comedy that you've had on, right? Yeah, yeah. I know you've had other people that are entertaining characters and influencers, and I know and Vicky Patterson does acting and all that. But that's this all I do, right? Now, correct me if I'm wrong. There is not another art form other than stand-up that can be measured in the same way sport can. So if we have Four sprinters now, four girls come up here and we all sprint, they all sprint 100 metres. We can tell who the fastest is. There's no bullshit, right? 100 metres. If you bring three stand-ups on now and we put a decibel machine on there and count applause breaks, it's the same audience, it's a rough demographic split in here tonight. At the end of the night, we can't tell who the most profound or original was, but we certainly could tell who was the funniest. How fucking terrifying is that, True. that I do an art that can be objectively measured in a non-bullshit way? I can't go afterwards, yeah, but it's funny in a way that elicited chuckles in a creative, boundary-pushing way. It's like, nah, mate, Tommy Sparkles was funnier. Suck it up. 
And have you learned a way of dealing <laughs> with Michael. the feedback that's instant in the room? But I think also, you know, you're in a really um, competitive industry, right? Yeah. And you would have, I guess, had an ambition of where you wanted to be at the age you're at, or you would have wanted to be at a certain place at a certain time. And if, if either that hasn't happened or you've had lulls in your career, periods where you've yeah. struggled, what tips have you learned to deal with that? Because, again, that's something that's transferable yeah. to everyone in here, no matter I'm, what their job. I'm trying to use, like... Pr practical language you know when you listen to things like this i want people to give me real practical things that i can take away and do um i did love the johnny wilkinson one by the way but i felt like i was tripping afterwards it was so like mystical my head was like oh um yeah lulls and lulls the so when you do stand up if you get any sort of quick heat at the beginning like i got you you get like this ski jump takeoff there's two types of ski jump takeoff in any career there's the commercial or mainstream, everyone likes you, whew, that's the one you want, because you, that tends to hold, hold. And then there's the critical, oh, it's the original and brilliant takeoff, which I got much harder, because you go up there and everyone's like, go on then. Now, you get that jump, and that's all lovely, you get about five years of that, and then it's like, whew, you need the next jump that leads into a more long-term, sustainable career. For me, that is what I will hope, touch wood, will be a one to 3,000 seater that I can play on to. Very happy with that. So, Now, how did I get from that to that first jump to the second one? That is any job that can happen. So my numbers never dropped, but they flattened off. And I knew there was an issue because I was doing the most television and radio and all the posh things you can do I'd ever done, and my numbers were levelling. You mean ticket sales? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that doesn't make sense. If I'm like on IT chatting to Graham Norton one night and I've got two series at this point, two, I knew I'd made a mistake. And this is where you call what do you call it? Not owning it, responsibility. Yeah. I was quick to spot it. It's hard, it's really hard if it's your business, I don't care what you do, if it's a business and you put your savings and remortgage your house and pushed all your chips in, to take responsibility that you might have fucked up is hard. It's even harder when you are the bell end with the big ego that's, that is the business. Um, and I realized what I'd done. I don't like talking about it because I don't want people to remember that I did it. We won't tell anyone. But what I'd done is, I've given you my background. I'm, I'm a real person. I can't change who I am. The problem is if you come from the type of background I am, where no teachers ever look twice at you and no one's ever thought you amount to anything, if you, once you get a bit of exposure and people like you, it just, it just goes to your head. And I made a few changes. It, uh, what I was talking about on stage, I started talking about being a stand-up in stand-up routines, i.e. how unrelatable is that shit? And also, like, developed this bizarre haircut with a streak in it. Very attention-seeking behavior. Did you wear a mascara? Yeah, it, it, yes, full I remember wanker that now, happened, yeah. right? <laughs> I saw a few months reminded of it. <laughs> I was single. I didn't have a good woman yeah. at the time to, to, to sort me out. That's part of the reason. Lindsay basically saved my ass because I fell in love with Lindsay. She was like, you're a good-looking lad. You're dressing like a twat. Sort it out, right? <laughs> now, some of you are thinking... What does it matter, right? I'm a performing artist. I should be able to go on with my hair in horns, waving glitter. If it's funny, it's funny. That's what we want from our entertainers. Unfortunately, that is incorrect. When you are plowing a business that has authenticity, my dad, my nan, my mum in a shelter, blah, 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 I'm, I'm doing funny things about my family, but I'm in, am I allowed to swear properly on here? Yeah. Like cunty skin tight trousers and, like, and like an eyeliner. There's a disconnect. So people are like, oh my God. He's not working class mate that we can relate to, that we want to pay and go and see. Yes. He's actually just a pretentious, attention-seeking penis. How much of what he says is a lie? I had to quickly take responsibility for that error. Quickly. So why had you done the dressing up and things? Did you I was just rolling. You with, like anyone in this room who's ever got drunk at a wedding, I was just rolling with the attention. How many times have you woken up the next morning and go, oh, what a bell end, but everyone was cheering me on. I was dancing on the table. It was the career version of that. Right. I needed, a, this is my first, so now we come to the first practical thing you have to have the courage to do. Make sure you welcome people that are willing to be very negative about you when there's a real negative to be stated and you're not going to bite their heads off. So I needed Lindsay to tell me, you're dressing like a twat, stop shagging all these girls, just shag me, I love you, blah, blah, blah. 
I needed a ma I needed a manager. I sacked off my management, who were brilliant and made me lots of money. But I needed a manager who was just says no to stuff. Tonight, as you know, it's a bastard to organise anything. My manager, if I even show a bit of ankle in the wrong way, it has to be signed off. Mm. He is so strict. I'm like, yes, look at the amount of money. And it's on ITV and I get to learn a musical number. No, absolutely not. We work very hard to get you to this point. That's what you need. Yeah. Someone, I literally will call him. If this was being filmed tonight, I would have said, what shall I wear? I even texted you, did I not? Yeah. What should I wear? Um, I said a high performance hoodie. And you yeah, he did, yeah. <laughs> So th that's my first tip. It's really hard if you're someone who's easily triggered like I am from having a negative parent telling you things are going to be shit all the time. But if you're running a business and you see your figures going like that, you could have yes people around you. Really dangerous. Very fucking dangerous. I just caught the plane when it was doing that. Bang. Hair, a little bit more manageable. These size down in skinny, started wearing a suit, respecting the audience, stopped lying about my age. That was something I was doing because I looked young for my age. You know, I just became more authentic yeah. again. So that, I mean, there's a third element there and you just referenced it about the age issue. Yeah. I think there's something as well about, oh, like you've described it as responsibility or own in it, that yeah. when you've made a mistake, what I remember you talking about there is you held your hand up and admitted it. You didn't try and... I didn't see... Again, I didn't... I'm like, what is the big deal if someone lies about their age in showbiz? Do you know what I mean? So there's probably, a bomb's probably just gone off in Syria that day and someone gives a shit if I've lied about my... I couldn't get my head around it. It wasn't... It's not an issue if you lie about your age. The issue is if you're peddling authenticity on stage right. and then lying. You've got... You're damaging your business. That's what this is. Make no mistake. There's nothing special about what I do. It is a, 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 a business with a skill at the heart, like every single person. Um, so I had to quickly realize that inauthenticity was, for my business, a really, really dangerous trait for the type of stand-up I want to do. You know, like if you watch another brilliant stand-up, you should go and see Rob Beckett. You just know Rob, he's Rob, and that's what he's going to be like when he's off. Well, now that's what I make sure I'm like, like I was for the first five years. I went back to being like that again quickly. But um, I also did some practical things to get the numbers up as well. Because what happened was, again, I don't like putting it out there, but the, the TV work then started to get a little bit less. I'm back up now. You're fucking all over the place. It's irritating almost. But I was like, how can I... When I was in the ad agency, they called it river jumping. Have you heard what this phrase before? River jumping. It's where instead of trying to find a solution for your craft, doing what you do, whatever it is, you look at a totally separate industry and go, what would they do in right. a similar bind? So what would, my rock, what would the rock climber do if he was tired but needed to get to the, and analyze it and just read up and it might provoke something to the side, to your adjacent river that you wouldn't have expected. There's a practical exercise anyone in this room can do tonight. I don't care what your challenge is, whether you've got the latest cool stationers on the high street and your numbers are flatlining. What did Russell the comedian do to, when he hit, and is there something you can do there? There's power and authenticity for sure. So, and it, I've gone from, um, I've gone to rock climbing there, but if it's a river that's close to you as well, that makes it easier. So, for example, if you're a rock climber, what would a boxer do? Sort of like a cousin. So I was doing like a project with a YouTuber who everyone's like, you know, the snobby old school stand up. Yeah, they're digital, man. They're different to us. You know, we tread the boards with the real deal. I'm going to find someone with no fucking experience of what I do. Nothing and ask them what they would do in my position if I want to get more stand-up out there than anyone else. What can I do? How can I, I can't do, have I got news for you every week? I can't be on Mock the Week every week. How can I grow bigger? And I'll never forget it, this lad was literally just turned 18. I was filming uh, something for Netflix called Stupid Man Smartphone where you had to survive using just your smartphone. We were in a dugout snow trench hiding from dogs. It was a, a sniffer dog challenge, like a hunted challenge. So we had nothing to do but talk. And he said something to me which blew my mind. Why do your lot never put your stand-up online? And I was like, what do you mean? And he, I was like, we do. We do live at the Apollo. No, no, you, miss, you misunderstand me. Why do you not give your shit away that hasn't yet been televised? Why don't you stand in front of... And I, was, I explained it because it takes months to hone it. Why would you give your stand-up... If I put my stuff online for free and you came to the Lowry and paid, you'd be furious. He went, no, no, you misunderstand me. You know the stuff that you throw in the bin the next tier down. That is good enough for online. 
People just want to laugh over their lunch. They want to giggle over their pot noodle. Right. What about the topical stuff like Boris and the garden party that by this time next week will be boring and passe? Put that out. And I was like, what the fuck? I, got, I went home. I'll never forget it. I went to the shop, bought a sat-nav holder for my phone, stuck it on the window, put my phone in it and said, I'll just call it caning. That's what I'll call it because it's, like it's obviously a pun. And I said, top three stories that week. Kanye West, sorry, he's a bit coarse. His girl he was seeing had stuck a thumb up his bum and he was trending in the news, people making fun of him. <laughs> and Kim Kardashian had had an argument with Bette Midler and her response was to get her boobs and parts out like that, with a black bar across, do you remember? So I just spoke about that, didn't write it down, put no craft into it, just improvised for seven minutes, cut it to three minutes, one camera, so it looked like I was doing jump cuts on purpose. It isn't, it's just I've got one camera, how else am I going to do it? Put it out. 70,000 people watched that. Now, that's hardly a viral video, but at the time, my Facebook page had 37,000 likes on it. It had gone to double what was on my page. I was like, I've just played to as many people I play to on a tour with a shitty thing I've thought up on the spot. Then I started to hone this. I realized a single subject was better. I realized that riding the hashtag, so Boris Garden Party, like I did last week, if you jump on that hashtag and surf it, more people will watch around. Then they started to do 200,000, a couple of million here and there, and there was a direct translation to ticket sales, maybe a quarter of a percent. Because if I'm performing stand-up down the barrel of my phone and you're la laughing in your lunch hour, you don't have to translate and go, I wonder what your stand-up's like live. You're ever going to think, oh, don't fancy that, prick. Or you're going to be, he looks funny, purchase. Didn't do it for that reason. I did it to get my jokes out there. Amazing. And, and I owned this, and I ended up in a meeting in Facebook. I'll, just, I'll, be, I'll be quick. Yeah. Can you believe there was not one other stand-up comedian on planet Earth in any language, like a touring act, that had thought to do that at this point? This is 2017. Not one. I was in Facebook's headquarters. They checked. Not in any part of Africa, South America, had a stand-up who sells tickets in an analog way gone, bang, right, here's stand-up as though I'm on stage, ever. Amazing. I mean, those stories are brilliant, right? And I think what's great <laughs> but is that it's easy for us to sit here and have a conversation about being a comic. But actually, if we look back at the things we've discussed over the last yeah. hour or so, you're talking about adaptability, taking responsibility, yeah. learning from your parents, putting joy at the center of everything that you do. They are all things yeah. directly translatable to the lives that everybody in this room is living. But the, but the biggest twist, of course, was you did have stand-ups going, aren't you worried? Just like giving you stand-up. might look a bit desperate. Uh, but by the time some fucker ate a bat in March 2020, <laughs> I, guess who was the prepper who had the beans in the basement? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Russell Kane! Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.